Walkable places are more inclusive places. They're more equitable places. They're places that are better for public health. They're better for the environment. They're more economically vibrant. I mean, the list goes on and on, but everybody is included in that vision of walkability. Even people that are- They're more, they're more rollable and they're more bikeable for sure. Yeah. You know, anything you do to make a, a place more rollable or surprisingly, perhaps more bikeable, makes it safer for pedestrians. And that's a surprise. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Jeff Speck and Chris Dempsey with Speck Dempsey, a new super firm that has been formed. <laughs> we are gonna be talking about uh, why they teamed up to create their own uh, firm, trying to transform our built environment, our cities into more walkable, bikeable, livable places. It's a good one, so let's get right to it with Jeff and Chris. Jeff, Chris, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Great to be on with you. Yeah, thanks, and great to be back, John. Yes, yes, a return visit from Jeff Speck. <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, Jeff and I go way back, so I, I, you get to start off with the intro. Who the heck is uh, Chris Dempsey? John, really appreciate the chance to be on with you and have enjoyed catching up on your podcasts and, and YouTube presentations. So it's an honor to be on. I grew up in Brookline, which is where I still live. And Jeff and I are neighbors in this community. It's a walkable transit oriented community and transportation policy has really been the theme throughout my career. I served as assistant secretary of transportation for Governor Deval Patrick in the first term of his administration. Uh, I also led Massachusetts' largest transportation advocacy group called Transportation for Massachusetts, working statewide to invest in public transportation, walking and biking, making our transportation system more sustainable, more environmentally friendly. And I've served in, at the local level in my community as an elected town meeting member and as an appointed member of the Transportation Board, where we had responsibility for really all, the entire public way from from curb to curb or property line to property line, making decisions on sidewalk widths and where to stop signs go and parking policies. So whether it's in my professional career or in my civic engagement, I've always been engaged and involved in, in transportation and delighted to have launched Spec MC with Jeff on January 1st of this year. We've got a great set of clients that I'm sure we'll be able to talk about today, um, but it's uh, very much a continuation of all that I've been about in my 20 years experience. And John, I should add that when, I mean, I didn't know Chris all that well at this time, but when, when COVID hit and Brookline led the Boston area, was ahead of Boston in terms of turning driving lanes into biking lanes and, and parking lanes into, you know, expanded sidewalks and all that stuff that, that some people did in response to COVID. Um, Chris was one of the people behind that. Uh, I only found that after we partnered, but we had the Boston news cameras down here in Coolidge Corner, and I had one kid on a bike and one on a pogo stick, and we were taking advantage of the, the four-laner that had become a two-laner so that we had extra room for, uh, for walking and biking. And uh, that's the kind of stuff Chris has been doing for some time. Th that effort actually got the transportation board in Brookline into the New York Times, which I don't think had ever happened before. Normally, it's a pretty <laughs> sleepy, locally focused body, but in that case... We were proud to be leading the country on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, you know, uh, Jeff, I'm assuming that most of the audience knows who the heck you are, but you never know. So who's Jeff Speck? <laughs> oh, geez. Well, I should introduce my my other partner who's joined me for this call. This is Fundido. Yay! Uh, who who, who is, has been a favored uh, participant in other similar uh, exercises, but I'll let him go um, and focus on myself. <laughs> I'm a city planner who was trained as an architect and who thought that he was going to be doing buildings and I like to say, you know, the kitchens and bathrooms of the very rich uh, for a career until in 1989, I heard Andre Stuani speak and give his classic lecture, which was called Towns versus Sprawl. And uh, I thought it was the best story I'd ever heard. I uh, knew that I wanted to redirect my design career towards, you know, the scale of work that would have a greater impact on people's quality of life. I also knew that it had to be a book like, oh, my God, you know, 
the fact that there are places we love and places we hate, and there are rules that underlie both, and the rules only allow us now to make places we hate, and we can change that, uh, was such an important message. And I actually wrote Andres and Liz in 1989 and said, let me ghostwrite this for you, and they never returned the letter. Uh, but by 2000, when I had been working with them for seven years, we finally came out with Suburban Nation, which was that story. Right. But I spent 10 years at DPZ managing or leading about 40 projects, uh, including a lot of new town work, a lot of downtown master plan work, um, street redesign, that sort of thing. Then I got appointed to the National Endowment for the Arts, where I uh, led the design discipline for four years and got to oversee the Mayor's Institute on City Design, which is this incredible program that brings mayors and designers together. I left there in 07. And since then, I was running what was effectively a one-man firm, uh, strangely called Speck & Associates. The name came out of the fact that I had an employee at first, but after she had our second child, my wife Alice resigned from the firm uh, to pursue greener pastures. And um, I've been off, uh, operating in collaboration. I didn't take the associates away because I've been operating in collaboration with lots of other firms, with DPZ, with Stantec Urban Places, with Nelson Nygaard, with um, Overland Associates, with Kronberg, you know, so many great urbanists who we've all come to know, John, at the CNU and in the other forums that we enjoy together. I've had a great time doing jobs with people I admire and who I learn from uh, for, you know, 16 years. But I reached the point where I didn't feel like I was getting this to scale. Right. And more instrumentally, the demand for the kind of work that we've been doing, particularly uh, downtown street network redesign, street redesign and downtown master planning, that the demand is just now through the roof. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 15 years ago, nobody knew what a walkability study was because I hadn't done one yet. I've now done about 17 of them. And cities are now asking for those by name. Uh, so that's an important tranche of the sort of work that we do that, that, that Chris and I are pretty convinced is going to become the biggest tranche of what we do. Right. Because it's so easy to fix a downtown. And most of our downtowns, our historic downtowns, are doing pretty well in terms of their urban design, with the exception of the streets. Right. And so as early as three years ago or so, I started looking for the right partner who could grow this operation to scale. And I wasn't determined to do it unless I found the right partner. And I wasn't putting a lot of effort into, into business models or business plans or anything. But when Chris became available, uh, I knew that he was the right person. And the, how long has it been, Chris? The three months that we've been working together <laughs> um, with a lot of months of planning uh, beforehand have convinced me that we're going to have a pretty big operation within a pretty limited amount of time. So far, so good, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been very busy at Spec Dempsey, and I overcomplicated or further complicated things by also welcoming my first child to the world uh, in January, so in that very first month. So I've got an eight-week-old at home. Um, so it's been a busy three months for this, this young dad, um, but a, a ton of fun, and it's going to be a very productive and successful partnership. Yeah. Well, A, it was a huge surprise to me that this, you know, got rolled out. I'd known Jeff for so long, you know, being this, you know, pretty much solo operator. And like you said, Jeff, you know, working in concert with other firms and other individuals that we know in the uh, urbanism realm. Uh, but when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is cool. Now, who the heck is, is Chris Dempsey? <laughs> so I started, I reached out to you on, uh, on LinkedIn, or maybe we were already connected. I can't remember. But, and I think, you know, Jeff, correct my, my, uh, my memory here, but I think you actually got out on LinkedIn because before you weren't, correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know how exciting this is going to be to your listeners, but I am on LinkedIn now. Yeah. Um, and I, I was on it when I started my firm. And then I found that um, I was just overwhelmed with uh, stuff. Yeah, stuff. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, 
I didn't mention my book, Walkable City, which I guess I should when introducing myself. But when Walkable, Walkable City came out in 2012, and then I did a couple TED Talks after that, yeah, I, I just got too many people reached out. And now I have Chris who's excited about people reaching out. So he, he told me to get back on LinkedIn. So I did. I was delighted. Thank you, Chris. I was delighted for that because, uh, you know, obviously as a content creator, you know, with the Active Towns channel, I'm pushing content out multiple times a week. And I'm also managing that content and pushing that content and advertising that content across multiple platforms. I think I counted at last count, it's something like nine different platforms or multiple identities on the same platform, including X, including LinkedIn and Facebook and whatnot. So uh, thank you for for getting Jeff over into the uh, professional world of LinkedIn. That was uh, wonderful to see. uh, It's a lot less toxic than uh, Twitter, where I've been spending my time. So they all have their pros and cons. Yes. John, this speaks to the complementary nature of our partnership together um, because I went to business school. And so you're sort of required to be on LinkedIn. If you went to business school, you don't get your diploma until you've got a good LinkedIn profile. Uh, and then of course, by contrast, Jeff went to design school. Now I have not adopted um, what's required to get a diploma at the GSD where Jeff went, which is you have to have a fancy pair of eyeglasses. We're black also, you have to wear black. Yeah, wear black all the time, yeah. Uh, so we're working on that, but we're, we're, a good, we're a good partnership and very complimentary in the ways that we think about the world and want to want to work with our clients and partners to do really special things. And I think that's important too, the way that we think about the world and, and kind of like where we come from, you know, my background is in, is in behavior modification, health behavior, public health. And so I have that sort of, uh, you know, behavior side, psychological side of the, and the intersection of the built environment. But I too, you know, uh, spent a third of my coursework in my, uh, my graduate program in the MBA school at, uh, at, at the University of Michigan. So yeah, I've got that marketing side of me too. That's like, okay, I gotta be <laughs> out here working all these different platforms. So uh, ni- nice of you to uh, bring a little bit of that uh, professionalism uh, from a, a business standpoint and encourage him to get out on the uh, professional platform of LinkedIn. <laughs> well, it's, it's fun also, like I didn't, I didn't anticipate this, but mm-hmm. what's really fun right now is, is the design exercise of designing a firm. Right. I hadn't, I hadn't thought that it was another job for design. Well, but. yeah. Now that you mentioned that, Jeff, let's look at your, your logo because that's part of it too. You even, I think tweeted this out about the design aspect of even logo design. Yeah. And actually John, uh, I did an email blast that we can connect your, I hope you'll connect your uh, viewers to. My most recent email blast, the fellow at uh, Pentagram who did the design did a wonderful kind of animated um, little essay on how we got to the final outcome. But the, the, the short story is that from my days at the National Endowment for the Arts, um, I got to know Michael Beirut, who if you know anything about graphic design is, um, you know, is legendary. And um, when we were putting the firm together, I was like, oh, no, no way that no way we can afford Pentagram, you know, the best graphic design, the best kind of design, overall design, um, product design, graphic. Well, I shouldn't say product, but, you know, um, what do you call it? Branding and graphic design and conceptual design firm out there. Everyone who knows this uh, admires Pentagram. And uh, just on a lark, I reached out to to. Michael and I said, "Hey, we need a logo and kind of a branding exercise. Are you? Uh, I know we can't afford you." And he said, "I think I can share this." He said, "Tell us what you need and tell us what you want to pay, and we will do that for you." And I was like, "Wow! I wish, I wish everyone told me that." <laughs> so like we no, went through a lot of no different, BS, we went, you know, just yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, transparency. Put it out there. So we went through a lot of different um, permutations. We had a a walk, don't walk that was spec MC sign. If you can imagine that we had kind of the expected striding uh, figures and we had all sorts of, you know, they took us through a thousand fonts. We're like, we, we don't need to spend so much time on they're, they're font obsessed. Um, but the, the intern on the job uh, who a- actually, actually happens to be in school in Boston, he hit upon the, the ease as the crosswalk. And we were so delighted with it. We came up with 
a lot of permutations of that, but we wanted something ultimately that was more subtle, clear to its intention, but not too in your face. And let's give that intern a shout out. His name is Ethan Pigeon, and he's graduating from Northeastern this year. So if someone listening to this is looking for an exceptional graphic designer and brand designer, reach out to Ethan. I've confirmed he is on LinkedIn, which we know is your favorite platform, John. So there people can go. find him I have there. A feeling, uh, I, I have a feeling he's going straight to Pentagram, but we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that it's my favorite uh, platform. Uh, I, I don't like to show favorites just in case the gods are listening. <laughs> Social media gods. Um, so, yeah, so this is super exciting, you guys. Uh, I, I love the fact that, you know, this has come together and it's come together in the way that it has. It sounds like, Jeff, this was like good timing from your perspective. You You've been like doing this hard for well over a decade. Uh, we just, as you mentioned, uh, we'll go back over here, you know, to the, the actual book. You had just mentioned that, um, you know, the Walkable City book, we just celebrated, of course, the 10-year the anniversary of the original version of it. I had you on the channel here to celebrate the release of the 10 year anniversary and the 100 plus pages uh, at the end of the book because you made the decision. I think this was a very, very astute decision of leaving the, the original book intact and then adding the additional 100 pages where you were able to provide some reflections. Uh, including a chapter on bicycling and, and other types of things. Um, for those and who and have, there's a new introduction from Jeanette Sadek Khan, which is that's very valuable right. Yes, as well. a new introduction by uh, Jeanette uh, JSK, which is freaking awesome. Uh, for those who haven't seen that episode, yeah, you, you, guys, you, you want to pop on over and see that episode. But uh, you know, for those that didn't see that episode, just real quickly, uh, uh, you know. Say a few words as to why people should get the new book, because I think it is important, uh, you know, being able to go back. And if 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 you have the first book already memorized, then read the preface and by, or introduction by, by Jeanette Sadekan and then read the final hundred pages. So, I mean, so much has happened in the last 10 years. So much has evolved. I've learned a ton. I was pleased that almost nothing in the uh, initial version was wrong, tremendously wrong, enough to be cut, except for one small passage on Zipcar, which turned out, I think, to be a little bit less of a factor than I had anticipated. But there were a lot of surprises, I think, particularly, and this is uh, almost a, 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 not a truism, it's a truth, that it's, it's the bicycle infrastructure as you mentioned, that is evolving the quickest in our cities. Right. We finally have a standard expected of us in the more progressive cities in the U.S. that is the equivalent of what I experienced in Berlin in the 1990s, right? We're finally catching up. Um, but there, there's uh, a housing crisis that was not really fully understood uh, 11 years ago. There's you know, what, what Walkable City did that I think made it made it valuable was that I had read everything, right? I had read, you know, Chris Leinberger's work. I had read David Owen's work. I had read Donald Shoup's work. I had read, uh, you know, all the great bicycling books. Uh, I had read uh, Frank and Frumpkin and, uh, and uh, who was... Uh, uh, Dick Jackson. Dick Jackson, who was, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's... Uh, health guy. I had read their book and um, with their blessings, and this was, you know, none of them were jerks, right? They were all great people who wanted to get the message out. And with their blessing and often their permission, I mean, often their editing, Donald Shoup even reviewed the chapter on parking. Um, I was able to consolidate all that into, into one thing. But then the question is, what did, what else was written that was really important or at least what other conversations were out there on the ether that were really important that hadn't made it in. Probably the biggest one was The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein and the, the lessons we all learned about, you know, how the segregated landscape was very carefully designed and implemented by the federal government that needed to be discussed as well. And then a lot more experience actually seeing the things that we had worked on get built and how they had functioned that also lends important information to the conversation about what to do in cities. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it, what's interesting too is I consider like where you guys are based out of, you're based in the Boston area, right there in Brookline, uh, right across the river from, I think one of the most exciting places uh, in, in Cambridge and Somerville that are really starting to, I think just, you know, t- hit it out of the ballpark in terms of transforming some of the built environment. Uh, we're seeing uh, continuous sidewalks and continuous side paths there in both Summer, Somerville and in uh, in Cambridge. Uh, and this, you know, and to your point, Jeff, it's, it's all changed in terms of what our cycling infrastructure needs to be and looks like now. Talk a little bit about that experience, uh, you know, Chris, you know, living so close to, you know, a, a, these communities that are starting to really transform and starting to put truly world class all ages and abilities facilities in place. I can think of like, oh God, what is it? Western? Is it Western Ave right there Western in Cambridge? Ave. Yeah, that is, you know, physically separated cycling infrastructure, continuous pathway, continuous sidewalk. Uh, I mean, this is world class and it's in North America. We don't have to go all the way to Utrecht to see it. And let me introduce Chris. Let me introduce Chris here. Yeah. We both are bike commuters. Chris more so than me. The distinction is that Chris doesn't own a car and never has. Ah, I like that. Yes. And, and I've, also, it? I've also lived on Western Avenue. And, and so I've used those bike lanes or bike paths. Well, then you probably you probably saw the b- before condition then, too. I, I was there right after it had been finished. And, and so was a big beneficiary of it. I was only there for about a year that I lived there. But, you know, tied to that discussion of ne- having never owned a car, um, I grew up in a one car household and my dad was a bicycle commuter before bicycle commuting was cool. I mean, he was, he was commuting on bike in the seventies and eighties. Uh, he had about a two mile commute from uh, our home to where he was a vice principal at a local elementary school. And that's how he got around. And so, um, that's it's sort of in my blood and he was my role model in terms of getting around without needing a vehicle. But you're absolutely right, John, that Cambridge and Somerville are leading the region and leading the country uh, in terms of their expansion and embrace of bicycle facilities. And I think what's happening there is really a virtuous cycle where you had some great political leadership, in particular from Mayor Joe Curtitoni in Somerville and a very progressive Somerville City Council, as well as in Cambridge, where you had a city manager who was willing to embrace this, but was pushed by a council. Um, Cambridge's city council is a really interesting one. Everyone's elected citywide through ranked choice voting, and the, co- the politics of that are extremely complicated. Interesting. But they were able to build a, a pro cyclist majority. And what happened there is because they were expanding the infrastructure, they were encouraging more people and especially more families, which means ultimately more voters to embrace cycling as a part of their daily lives. And once people were embracing that as part of their daily lives and seeing the benefits of it, then that became an important issue for them to vote on. And so they were electing even more people on the council who were willing to embrace those policies. And that's happened in both of those places. And we're benefiting as a region. And and, you know, what I'm hearing from you is as a country um, from that virtuous cycle, because people are seeing that it's working, that the fears of uh, congestion or the lack of parking that are often brought up to block those initiatives are not occurring, that this is good for small business, that it's good for public health, and that it just works for families. Um, the, the culture that has developed in those communities just around cargo bikes, for example, right. Camberville, we call it Camberville, Cambridge and Somerville together. I there's, a, there's a cargo bike uh, lending nonprofit organization. A guy named Chris Smith runs that. And he um, has the producers of these um, bikes basically lend them to this lending library as a way for people to test them out. So you can go, you can just basically go on his webpage, um, decide to borrow one for a couple of days, and then it's yours for a couple of days to try out. Um, the latest in, in greater Boston and, and really coming out of that Camberville experience is um, it's appropriate. Jeff mentioned Zipcar. Um, but we're expecting later this year that there will be a company that is going to launch cargo bike sharing 
on the model of, of Zipcar sharing. Nice. Uh, and I know they're going to be in Boston and Cambridge and Somerville as their three first communities in this area. That's an exciting proposition. You heard me say earlier in this conversation that I'm a new dad um, and don't own a car. So I'm, I'm proud to be a future cargo bike dad. And I'm going to take advantage of the lending library and that company to pick out which one is going to be best for me and my family. Yeah. I, my prediction is it'll probably be the urban arrow or something that looks like it. Uh, I love that. My, uh, I should say, uh, John, my wife and I had one of the first, the only one I saw uh, bucket bikes in Washington, D.C. when we had our first child. We finally bought a car when we had our second child, like the day after we had our second child, <laughs> we finally bought a car. I want to mention also in Somerville, uh, Chris mentioned Mayor Curtitone. Um, the fellow who implemented most of that was George Proakis, who you probably know, who's now city manager of the town of Watertown. But George uh, is a longtime new urbanist, old friend. He co-teaches with me every year my, my two-day Harvard class. That's right. Which is an extension uh, school class at the GSD that's available to anyone it's May 30th through 31st. It is selling out. For the first time, they've had to put a cap on the number of students. Mm. Um, and I would tell your audience to get in quickly if they want to go. It's two days of the walkable city with me and George, including touring some of these wonderful examples in uh, Somerville. Fantastic. Chris, I love uh, the virtuous cycle. I, I, I love uh, double entendres and puns. And, and uh, it made me think of this photo that you <laughs> have uh, sent along because, I mean, this is kind of to your point, Jeff, of, of kind of what was happening in the zeitgeist, you know, from 11 years ago and, and 12 years ago when you were writing the, the, the book uh, Walkable City. You know, and I've been in this this business of advocacy for active mobility for the better part of two decades now. And I remember when we were just fighting for like a painted, a simple painted shoulder, a painted bike lane. And and that's just simply not good enough. This this is not good enough. This is can I can I say like, you know, to indict myself with everyone else. Yeah. I mean, 10 years ago, I would have painted a door zone bike lane 10 years ago. I, I, and there's stuff you can find on the web where I'm recommending it. Yeah. Uh, we won't, you know, we won't do door zone bike lanes anymore. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, 10 years ago, we knew that this was inferior to a protected facility, but often it was all that we can get. And I think what's most important is the conversation in cities now has reached the level where people understand that this is not something that cyclists should have to settle for. It's not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. And especially as parents. I mean, when you think of it, you know, that image right there with uh, the child, you know, in that door zone bike lane, uh, you know, I, I can easily imagine, you know, that Honda element, you know, sharing the motor vehicle travel lane, you know, being right next to whatever that is, uh, you know, on the other side there, that Toyota, uh, you know, SUV it, it, those two should be sharing space next to each other. And, you know, that young lady should have, a la Western Avenue, a parking protected, hopefully separated, physically separated lane. I always show that slide after I show the, the, the photo from the Village Voice of a young girl proudly enjoying the Prospect Park West bike lane in New York City, which is so well protected. And and I say, you know, nobody, nobody wants their daughter in the door zone. Um, I've sent you a bunch of images that mostly are from my, uh, you know, my barnstorming tour lectures that uh, that I give. Uh, I think it would be useful to tell your audience that the typical way that Spec Dempsey gets involved in communities that often begins with a lecture, and people often call up and say, "Hey, will you will you work with us?" And I say, "Sure, but we we should do a lecture first to establish a, a certain level of conversation within the community, also to see if it's a good fit. In my experience, it's always a good fit. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I do want to see how folks react. And we, we gather a lot of energy around these lectures. And often they're like, oh, the mayor wants to meet with you before the lecture. And I'm like, no, I will not meet with the mayor before the lecture. I'll meet with the mayor after the lecture if the mayor comes to the lecture. But the most important thing is that the mayor and city manager and um, city council and other folks who have have uh, the wherewithal within the community are in the room. And this is why I hated the Zoom, the Zoom lectures. They need to be in the room and they need to see how the public reacts to these messages. Right. Because 
because the, the, the way that they see their constituents respond to the message of the walkable city is then what drives forward a positive change in those communities because people want this stuff. Um, and uh, actually, you know, the, 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 the opportunity for working in communities and for making change in communities is much less unless you've had this sort of public forum where people can get together. And I think Chris can elaborate, but we've even had some lectures that have been crowdfunded uh, where, you know, the fee wasn't available, um, uh, you know, from the municipality or from a foundation or anyone else, but just folks raise the money that way. I think that's a really good point is let's let's empower the community too to come together and say, you know, our, our leadership isn't there yet or they just don't have the money, but we're passionate about this. Uh, you know, we've been following, you know, Jeff's work, et cetera. And this new guy, Chris, he seems OK. Let's bring this together. Let's bring these guys in. And 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 I want to make the point, too, that the cities that you've been having some of the most profound impact in over the years, uh, Jeff, have been in like people would be like surprised. I mean, you're you're like working with cities in Oklahoma, cities in Iowa, I think, if I remember correctly, uh-huh. cities Bunch. in um, uh, you know Indiana. Indiana, boom, Indiana. You know? A lot of we're doing it. We're doing a ton of work in Indiana. Indiana may be our first office, actually, given how busy we are. Which we we love working in Indiana. Yeah. And and this particular shot here, this is Monon Boulevard. This is uh, most likely shot from the corner of a parking garage. I know this shot. I, I think uh, I think Brandon, also known as American Feetzer, took this uh, took this picture, I believe. Yeah. Now it's at night. So you don't have the images I have of daytime of all the people uh, enjoying it. And I have plenty of video, folks. If you just stay right here on the channel, you know, pop on over. I've interviewed uh, Brandon a couple of times and I've visited him. I actually rode my Brompton from Indianapolis on the Monon Trail all the way up to, uh, you know, Good for up you. to, to Carmel. Not- it's 15 miles. It's a piece of cake. It actually is a joy ride on the Monon Trail now because of what I call TOD development trail oriented development. There's tons of it happening all along the Monon now. Congratulations. Good. I've described this image a hundred times, so I want to let you, I want to let you, I want to let you describe what's there and then I'll correct anything you get wrong. But uh, I want to hear how you. The way I would describe this is just joyful. Um, I remember kind of the, the before factor that that exists here and I and I remember having a conversation you mentioned mayors I remember having a conversation with uh, Mayor Brainerd um, probably like circa 2018 and he was encouraging me to get there and what was really impressive for me when I finally had the chance to ride in and roll into this space was it gave me the sense that this was a solid North American example of of what I'm used to seeing when I'm traveling in Europe. And it is just a wonderful uh, space that is at human scale and really engages people. And what was really most impressive about what this has resulted in is exactly kind of what you see here in terms of the the level of density that's happening, the level of vibrancy that does happen, uh, especially during the summer, uh, further down the Monon Boulevard and for, further down the trail, you'll see an area where they do the farmer's market. There's so much vibrancy, so much livelihood that's taking place. And I think it's having a ripple effect too, not only on other communities throughout the Midwest, throughout the continent. Um, but it's also, I think, having a ripple f- effect in the rest of this city, this suburban place, where not everything is as walkable and bikeable as you'd like. They have an extensive off-street network of pathways, but there's still lots of room for improvement. Yes, it's having a ripple effect extremely locally in that we're now working in Fishers, Indiana, next door. We're now working in Westfield, Indiana, nor- what next door. And we have some completed work that's um, that's pretty built in Hammond, Indiana, in uh, New Albany, Indiana, in Elkhart, Indiana. Strangely, um, but the uh, th- this project is an example of a kind of a successive collaboration 
between, uh, you know, Mayor Brainerd's is kind of a serial, a serial monogamist when it comes to planners. So uh, he brings one in and then another one in and another one in. Uh, I did the planning and then Gail came in and modified it, uh, Jan Gail's firm. And then RAE Landscape actually did the details that you see right there. Um, I can't take credit for the details, which is why the, the bike lanes are actually redundant. There's a bike facility in the middle of the street and there's a bike facility on the edge of the street, which we have no problem with because everyone's walking in the bike lanes. They're biking in the walking lanes. They're biking in the driving lanes, walking in the in the brick streets. Um, it's mayhem in, a most, in the most wonderful way. Only the cars aren't going where they're not supposed to. And the big move that I made from a planning perspective was that there was essentially just this trail this recreational rails to ter- rails to trails trail that was the only thing that existed in kind of a, a post-industrial hinterland between the two hearts of this community. So it was a bipolar city with a main street to the north, the art and design district, and a civic center to the south with the David Schwartz's beautiful Palladian con- uh, c- uh, concert hall and the, the city hall and other municipal facilities down to the south. And no one ever walked between them except for exercise. And the, 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 I was the third planner on this job after two plans were not implemented. Right. And my simple proposal was that you need to embrace this trail with a, with a street, with a boulevard, and put the trail in the middle. And people were like, why would we besmirch a recreational trail with urbanism? You know, imagine. Um, but, of course, what the mayor understood and many others didn't was that particularly in a suburban city, if it's going to thrive as a active mixed use neighborhood, it needs to be a front. And the only way to make it a front was to have a street. Now, and if you design the street right, the, the cars aren't a blight at all. In fact, this street is a 10 foot driving lane next to an eight foot parking lane, single lane. Usually we give 20 feet for that, but we did it in 18 and no one's going more than five miles an hour on this street. It's, it's fantastic. Right. And if we take a look at some of the detail that we see when we see, you know, the the fact that, yeah, I mean, just like in the Netherlands, you know, the the travel zone that the, the motor vehicles have are paved in bricks. It sends a message that this is not a, an area for for speed. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm coming off of the suburban context where I've got my my typical black asphalt tarmac where I'm used to driving, you know, 30 plus miles per hour, it's clear that this is a different context. And the absence of the absence of curbs, right? The absence of curbs in that location. But, you know, a lot of the changes we make in cities, we are able to do with just with just paint. So it isn't important necessarily to spend a lot of money. I should say that, you know, every dollar that Carmel has spent on that that uh, facility it's made back in the tax revenue from the uh, investment increment that happened around it, right? So there's there's plenty of, of great stories to be told. One of my slides shows a, a doctored red stripe bottle that says restripe. And so I say, you know, don't repave, restripe. But then at the end of my show, I give the wonderful example of Lancaster Boulevard in Lancaster, California by our friends Moon and Polizoides, where they invested you know, I think $11.3 million in a complete rebuild of a horrible strode that was the center of their community into a, a wonderful new street. So they invested $11 million, but they got hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in new economic energy around that investment. This is an image from Oklahoma City. Uh, before, you can see they had a lot of four-lane one-ways running through the downtown. I presume you have the after as well, John, uh, in which it's turned into a two-lane, two-way, including a tram that runs <laughs> that runs down it. Um, Oklahoma City was my first walkability study and was fortunately completed around the same day that they learned they were getting a $200 million tax increment coming from a, a new tower landing in the downtown. Uh, folks who attend the Congress for New Urbanism experienced Oklahoma City uh, a few years ago, you know, it's it's not an amazing, you know, caramel in terms of the detail of the of the streets or the, you know, the non automotive nature. It's still a very automotive downtown. The message we shared with with conference attendees were, was just and the mayor said this, you should have seen it before, because as you showed in that before image, it was just uh, anti-pedestrian death zone. 
It was um, a whole and now it's, lot of this. Yeah. <laughs> and now, and now it's, it's just, a, it's a nice, normal, yeah. walkable downtown. And, and they're working the, you know, the, the neat thing about Oklahoma city and having the ability to experience that Jeff was, was just that you, you use, there was still plenty of the old stuff that still needs to be the before picture of Robinson there. Uh, but yeah, you should have seen it before. And at the same time, they're really working to improve upon where they're at. Because, you know, when we when we look at the reality of of this particular street, you know, I, I come up with like a half a dozen things that could be done better. But to your point, and you and I talked about this in, in our first episode, it's like you learned a ton even from when that was coming together and when you were working on that. Well, this was a, this was a city that... I mean, half the curbs you couldn't build on because of the repercussions from the uh, Oklahoma City bombing. Exactly. That it, yeah. that it made them afraid of parallel parking. Yep. And I had to convince them that, you know, a, a bomber was not going to be afraid of getting a parking ticket and they're going to put their truck wherever they want. Right. And we need to have parking to protect the curb where there's uh, extra space in the street. And, you know, importantly, we, we you know, we turn driving lanes into parking lanes and we turn driving lanes into bike lanes. And often in cities, even congested cities, you find streets that have more lanes than the current volume of traffic demands. Yeah. So Chris, talk through what it is you all will be doing with the the firm here. Yeah, you can see some of it pulled up here as example projects, many of them pulling from Jeff's decade plus at Speck and Associates. Um, we can help communities and we can help private developers in many different ways. A typical project for us might be a private developer that has access or ownership of a parcel that knows that they want to create a walkable place that knows that they're more likely to get the approvals that they need from the community if the place is walkable um, or just that it's going to create more long term value for their project when they're creating a walkable place. And they come to us because they know that anything that we're involved in and leading is going to end up as a walkable place. You, you could see earlier, higher up on our, our page there, the tagline we use on the top of our webpage is we make walkable places. And the reason that we do that is because, the reason we think that's so important is that walkability is, is the most essential unit of urbanism. And when you get walkability right, you're probably also getting cycling right and getting transit right and even getting housing right, um, certainly getting mixed use districts right. So you want to get walkability right first and the other things follow. Um, so that would be a typical project for us. And a good example of that would be the project that we're involved in right now in Kenmore Square in Boston, which today is a tangle of different streets that come together. It's called Kenmore Square, but there's really no square and there's really no place at all other than a major intersection. It's about a block from Fenway Park. It should be so much more than it is. And the design that we're working on there in conjunction with the city and with our client, which is Mark Development, will create a transformational public space. And we're proud to be sharing more about that with the public in the months ahead as that project advances. Another typical project might be a community that comes to us because they have a downtown that they know is not functioning at the level that it should. Uh, a great example of that would be Mansfield, Texas, where we are working at their historic downtown, the crossroads of Maine and Broad, that for many decades were essentially just regional highways. Um, they had, like many places, gone from a, a crossroads, a marketplace, to just a place to drive through. Um, and finally, after the business community asking for decades for it to be transformed more into a place to be, a place to shop, a place to walk, we're leading the effort to make that possible. In fact, we've just received approval from the city council there for a design that will include a, a roundabout um, and, a, and a road diet that will create exceptional public space and new green space and a whole lot more parking. Um, actually, along the lines of what Jeff mentioned earlier with Mool and Polyzides, their proposal or their, their plan that was implemented in Lancaster, California. Um, so we're really excited about being the people that are going to help unlock vibrancy and walkability in a place that had that 100 years ago, lost it at some point in the 20th century, but is ready to, to re-embrace it. 
Um, but another example would be a, a community where um, they know that they've got a housing need or a need for some new economic activity more broadly than just their downtown. Maybe it's they have 20 acres or 50 acres or 100 acres, and they want to make sure that they get their plan right, that they're not encouraging just more sprawl, that they're ending up with a new neighborhood that can be one of the best neighborhoods in their city because it's a place that supports um, mixed use, but also essential, uh, uh, importantly supports walkability at its core. You know, one trend we've seen over the past few decades is that cities aren't just going out to developers with RFPs anymore, right? Oh, we've got a, you know, the city owns a parcel downtown. We have a big old parking lot, or we've got, you know, 20 acres that, that we effectively control. But cities are creating the plans beforehand. This is what we've done in Carmel for the last site along that boulevard that we were discussing called Carmel uh, Plaza, sorry, called Monon Plaza, that was a pretty dead, huge tarmac at the center, strip shopping center. And the city's redevelopment agency basically took control of it and commissioned us to make a plan that they then put out to the to the private you know, development community and said, this is the plan we'd like to see. Can you can you build it? And a, a, a early example of that and a very powerful one was the old um, airport in in Austin near you, John. Yeah. That became it's called Mueller now. Right. Spelled Mueller and pronounced Mueller or vice versa. Yeah, it's a uh, it's half and half. It's spe- it's spelled Mueller. Yes. And uh, half uh, Texans being what we are here. Um, I'm not native Texan, but uh, half the population pronounces it Miller and half of them Mueller. So, yes. OK. Well, when I was at the NEA, one of the projects that came before the Mayor's Institute, which I oversaw, was the city's proposal done with really good designers as to what the site could be. And that proposal was completed and a general plan and overlay code was created. Only then did they go out to the private market. And I believe it was Catellus Development who came in. Yep. And they hired the same planners and said, okay, we need a few changes, but let's do the Let's do this plan. And um, what's really important there is that the planners worked both for cities and for developers. So they understood when they did the plan for the city what a developer would be willing to willing yeah. to build. And, and so you're seeing more and more cities take advantage of that. Yeah. And if I can interject, I'm glad you brought that up as an example. Um, I spend a lot of my time filming there in, in that community. It's about 90, 95% built out at this point. So it's really super fun to film in. I'm able to, to get out there on the bike. And, and by the way, too, when we talk about walkable, in my mind, as a, a, an active mobility uh, scientist, somebody who's looking at behavior change in terms of encouraging people to walk, bike, use transit more frequently, when I hear you say walkable studies and walkability studies, I'm automatically translating that into this is going to be a also a more bikeable environment. This is going to be an environment that is conducive for people in mobility devices like wheelchairs and, and assisted scooters, things of that nature. So I, I just wanted to put that out because sometimes it, it may seem like we're limiting of saying, oh, no, this is just about walkability and it's only about 800 meters. No, 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 no. It's it's much more encompassing of it is a walkable, bikeable environment. And that's one of the things that you do spend uh, you know, time in that re- reboot of the 100 plus pages in, in the new version of the book. Yeah, I mean, it's the only real flaw that I'm aware of in the uh, verbiage that, that we've chosen, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so um, yeah, I, I have to I, say I, that, you, that it if, and I don't have a And I don't have a better solution to you, you know, from like, what do we call no, we it? We own it, man. An it's ours mobility. and we're sticking <laughs> yeah. with it. I mean, look, John, I think a lot of your audience probably knows this, but it's worth stating. Walkable places are more inclusive places. They're more equitable places. They're places that are better for public health. They're better for the environment. They're more economically vibrant. I mean, the list goes on and on, but everybody is included in that vision of walkability, even people that are. They're more, they're more rollable and they're more bikeable for sure. Yeah. You know, anything you do to make a, a place more rollable or surprisingly, perhaps more bikeable, makes it safer for pedestrians. And that's a surprise. You know, it's so funny. Everyone I know in New York City now is really upset about 
the e-bikes salmoning the wrong way down the bike lanes. And they'll tell you it's never been worse in terms of the interactions between bikes and pedestrians in New York City. And I was there and I had the same impression. Last year was the safest year for pedestrians in New York City in the history of recording pedestrian safety. In the safety history of here. recording, yeah. Yeah, which is which surprised me. But the I think it's important to communicate to your audience that for me, walkability began as just the best way to explain good planning. Exactly. It was not that I came, you know, like Mark Fenton from a walking perspective or, or like you, you know, from a health perspective and said, oh, we, we need to walk more. No, I mean, I was raised as an architect and an urban designer who wants to make great places. And I slowly discovered that if, you've, if you use walkability as your metric, you will find the best places. But then an interesting thing happened, which was okay, kind of building this general theory of walkability and what it means to be, to have walking be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. If you actually instrumentalize that and make it your framework for making design decisions, you actually end up changing some things and making some, some better decisions as a planner. Uh, when every question you ask is, is it going to make more it more walkable or less walkable? Yeah. This is a related concept to the what many people will know as, as the curb cut effect, which is with the, the existence of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, communities across the country have been forced to create curb cuts that are accessible to people that are rolling in a mobility device, and in particular in a wheelchair. Uh, but in fact, the, the biggest beneficiaries in many ways of that are people like me who are pushing, pushing strollers now right. and who can now push a stroller through a neighborhood much more easily than if those curb cuts didn't exist. Or a person who, who might be rolling a grocery cart to the local shop that couldn't do that before because it was hard to get it up and off the curb and can now do that. Or someone that's walking to, you know, from uh, their transit station to their hotel uh, to go to the airport uh, or come, come back from the airport and they've got luggage with them. All of those trips are now easier. The, the purpose of that curb cut was really just to serve people with disabilities, but everybody benefits. Walkability is the same way in that no matter who you are, you can benefit from a more walkable community. I'd like to rename that the curb, the curb ramp effect, because the curb cut is usually something we're fighting in cities that where they're bringing driveways across for, for drive throughs and ATM. Good point. Good point. Again, the website is specdempsey.com. Uh, Chris Dempsey and Jeff Speck, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. Hope to see you in person in Austin sometime soon. He, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jeff and Chris. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. Become an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org. Click on the support button. There's several different options including becoming a Patreon supporter. My patrons do get access to all this video content early and ad-free, so there's a really cool bonus. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.